Welcome everyone to Fun with WebGL 2.0, where we're going to make a 3D model viewer and beyond using just a browser and JavaScript as your main programming language. We'll start with the basic HTML template. This will allow us to have our canvas centered on the screen. We're going to start building our framework by creating a file called gl.js. The first thing we need is the WebGL context on the canvas, which gives us the GL functions we need for drawing. Instead of making a wrapper or some sort of main object, I've opted into making a function that extends the context with functions that will handle many of the common tasks we'll be doing in GL. On top of that, many of these functions end up returning the reference to itself, giving us the ability to chain calls, which I do find is a fun way to start coding setter functions. So for now we're going to set up just the basics to get started. We get the context by using the ID of the canvas that's being passed in start setting up some configurations, for instance setting the background color to white, then move on to adding some functions like clear and set size. We need clear to reset each frame for drawing with the background color that we've set. Then we have set size, which sets the size of the canvas you want to draw to. When we're playing around, I've noticed that I have to set the size of the style and the canvas size and the viewport to get things to run correctly, else I normally would see things being stretched out while drawing. Back in our HTML page, we're going to include the gl.js file we just created. We're going to have a global variable called gl and set up an onload event to start things up when the page is ready. The first thing we do in the load event is to get our gl context by passing in the canvas ID. Since the function returns our extended gl context and our custom functions are chainable, we're able to call set size and clear easily in one line of code. Without chaining, the code will look more like this. It's just my preference, but when you build your own framework, you can set up how it's feel comfortable for you. So at this point, you can go to your browser and you should see a dark page with a white square in the center. Congrats, you have a working G WebGL canvas. Now we're moving on to shaders. Shaders are these little programs you write that will run on the GPU. They essentially take an array of vertices, group them into triangles, and then try to color each one based on how you've written your shader. At the end of all, you should have a beautiful textured model. But for this tutorial, we're going to try to just get a single vertex rendered because if we can push one correctly, we can push thousands. There are four steps needed to get a shader set up before we can push any data to it and have it render. First, we need the shader code, which is written in GLSL. It's a C-like language. GL in general is very C-like to me based on how it works. Since we want to do some rapid prototyping, we're going to store our shader code in script tags on our HTML page. Here's our vertex and fragment shaders. The vertex shader handles each vertex in our vertex array. If we're running triangles, it would group together three vertices at a time and interpolate certain values between them. Not going into too much detail for now in what's going on in this shader, but all that's happening is that we're passing in vertice positions and the size of how big we want to draw our vertex. Once the GPU knows about our vertex, now comes in the fragment shader, which explains how to color it. In our fragment shader, we're only setting the color to black. Now let's make a new JS file called shaders. We're going to put together a static utility class that will handle many of our common shader functionality. Each step is essentially its own function. So the first step is to get our shader code. For that, we create DOM shader source, which will retrieve the contents of our script, script text. Next, we want to compile our shaders, which create shader. First, we create the shader placer that gives us the ID of it. That's passed in the source, then compile. From there, we need to check if it compiled correctly. We write to the console whatever error might have happened. We do a little cleanup by deleting the shader and exit out in the event of an error. So we do this twice, once for the vertex, then for the fragment. Finally, we need to take our two compile shaders and link them together as a program. Here we write create program to handle this. In this function, we create our program placeholder, then attach our two shaders and link them together. Like before, we should check for any errors in the process. There is some extra validation that can be done and if you're prototyping, just pass true and do validation in our new function. But once you're sure the code is really good, you don't need to do this extra validation. Once our program is linked up without errors, we can actually delete our shader since the final program is what we need for rendering. Now back at our HTML page, we're going to include our shader.js file. Then we start using the util class to perform the steps. As you can see, I put all the utility functions after each common step we had before. For step four, we didn't create any util functions because down the line we're going to use VAO and predefine the positions in our shaders, plus other things. 
So for now, we're just showing you the bare basics. In our code, we have a GL call to use program. You can you only use one shader program at a time. So if you need to do certain things with shader, you need to tell JL which one you currently want to work with. Let me explain a little bit about step four. In our shaders, we have two types of data that can be passed. The simple ones are called uniform. They're just global variables in our shader. These are the ones you will be setting for every frame of rendering. Next, we have attributes. These are basically pointers to data, many of which are just arrays of floats. Based on how we set up the attributes in a shader, it will buffer n amount of elements at a time. In our case, our shader has an attribute called eight positions, which is a vector three. That means it will buffer three floats at a time. So for every three floats, the vertex shader will be called. For this to work, we have to create a buffer on the GPU which will store the float array in its memory. So once we push all the data to the buffer, you don't really need it anymore in your app unless you're going to use some advanced stuff, but that's for a different time. So let's create this magical vertex we want to render. A vertex has three values, x, y, and z. This allows you to position something in 3D space. In WebGL, the coordinate system's origin starts at the dead center of our canvas. So with an array verts, we're creating a float array with three values, 0, 0, 0. That line looks weird because we're creating a float array but passing in an in array. WebGL is statically typed, but JavaScript isn't. So float32 array takes in a normal JavaScript array and turns it into something more WebGL friendly. You can use float arrays like normal arrays, and we'll be doing that later on with matrices to save time doing work with raw float arrays instead of making a JS array and then converting them to float32 arrays. Once we have our data, we gotta create a buffer which is a container for our array. Just like shader and program, we create something and get back its ID. And like everything else, we can only have one item active at a time. You can use bind buffer to select our buffer. We tell it array buffer because that's basically the global variable that holds the currently active buffer. With our new buffer now selected, we use buffer data to pass our array to the GPU for storage. We tell it that it's static, meaning the data will not change after we pass it in. There's other settings that make it dynamic so you can change the buffer frequently. Then we end it by unbinding the buffer, which is good practice. Now we're finally at the end. We have our GL context, we have our shader ready, and we have our buffer filled with floats. Everything up until now has been nothing but initialization. Now the first order of business is to activate our shader that we want to use. Then we start passing in some data. Now we're going to pass in how big we want the vertex to be drawn. The next thing is we activate our buffer that we stored our vertices arrays in. By using the position location variable, we can then point to shader's attribute to our buffer. Each attribute in uniform gets a number. In GL, they call it a location. I view it as kind of like an array, and you need to know the index you're working with. Kind of like how JavaScript, you have an argument array of a function instead of using the parameters you set up. At that point, the data passed to the function lives in an array that you have to know what each index is for. If you haven't noticed yet, GL is all about arrays. Just about everything is based on or reduced to the notion of arrays. So yeah, once we tell it the location of the attribute we're talking about, next you see is three, which is how elements in the array is in one chunk. Since this is a vertex data, it's three floats per vertex. This function then basically binds the currently selected buffer to the shader's attribute. This is why we need to bind the buffer first, enable the location, then the define the location, and then the data size and type. We unbind the buffer again because the shader's attribute is pointing to it now. Then finally we tell GL to draw these arrays. All we have to do is tell it to draw only points. There are several other options like lines and triangles, but for now we just want to see the vertices. The final parameter is important because that's when you tell GL how many vertices you want to render. For this example, I hard coded one. But ideally you want to get the length of the array vertice then divide by 3 to get your vertice count. Because remember, each vertex is defined by x, y, and z, which is represented as an array with three floats. If it all works out for you, you should be able to see a nice black square on your canvas. At this point, you should start playing around with the code. How about we add another vertex to the array? So going back to array vert, I'm going to add three more floats. As you can see, I put 0.5 for x and y. GL tries to be resolution independent. So all position values are just numbers between negative one and one. 
so you will never have an access value beyond that range. This is why we have floats. They are large decimal numbers that will give us tons of positions that, that can exist between negative 1 and 1. So with the new vertex added, I updated the draw array function with a number 2, because now we have two vertices to render. This is why it's better to calculate the vertice count instead of hard coding things, but I'll leave that as a challenge for you to do on your own. So after the change, you should see two squares on your canvas when you refresh the browser. So voila, all virtual worlds begin with the ver vertex on the screen. So why not for personal challenges play with the fragment shader? Change the values to something between 0 and 1 in the first three positions of the vector 4 of a final color. For more fun, why not try to create a vector 4 uniform in the fragment shader? Then use GL to pass in a color value. Mind you, many things exist between negative 1 and 1, or between 0 and 1. So for colors, we use RGB with each color defined by a number between 0 and 255. For GL, you need to normalize that range. So if you want white, you have to put in 1.0 instead of 255 for each value of RGB. We'll stop here for now. Next time we're going to set up a render loop, try refactoring some of our code to build up our framework and do a little bit of animations with our little vector. So till next time.